Last time, um, what you might have looked at was we're looking for um, a formalism to, uh, to be able to look at conservation. So, so far this week, what we've looked at are, first of all, the ideas of changing frames of reference. We talked about uh, substantial derivatives to be able to uh, evaluate what kind of frame of reference we're talking about, whether it's a static frame of reference or uh, one which is attached to something that's moving across the system and maybe squirting water out of it. So we can make those um, evaluations in a differential sense, but also kind of on a straightforward uh, vector sum sense. Um, the uh, last time we talked about convective and centrifugal accelerations, which come, come out of that. And we've also placed this formalism in terms of what's called Reynolds Transport Theorem, written uh, by, or developed by Osborne Reynolds, who is a famous uh, fluid mechanician, British fluid mechanician. And it has this kind of complicated relationship, which is really just a, a statement of balance of fluxes into a control volume and out of a control volume and their net accumulation. It's nothing, nothing more than that. Those fluxes, as you'd have seen last time, can be fluxes of mass. Um, they can be fluxes of momentum. Or they can be fluxes of energy. And these particular quantities, if you like, are what, is, what goes into Reynolds Transport Theorem. So it's just a, a formalism that does that. Um, in this theorem, we look at these amounts of mass, momentum, and energy per unit mass of the fluid which is in the system, or it could be per unit mass of the balls within the system. And so for each of these, if we're looking in this case at conserving mass, then substituting the B value for this, M over M is just 1. So this is just 1 for conservation of mass. And if you substitute it into this relationship here, you end up with an expression which includes the change in mass per uh, in the whole system is equal to, this is, you can think of this as an accumulation term. And you can think of this term as a mass in minus mass out. And so I won't go through all the, the nuances because you can see those in, uh, in 6.2. Um, uh, but if we put this as equal to 0, because in our larger system, the universe, if you like, there's no net change of, of, of mass, then you can write it in a slightly simpler form. Uh, which really says this accumulation term relates to the rate of change of mass <coughs> defined by density and volume in the system and the fluid flows in or out of the system. So this is the normal to the boundary flux. So this is... <coughs> boundary flux. And um, this is the, the velocity. So W is the velocity relative to the boundary. So it's getting a bit cramped up here, but that's important. And so if you remember our ship that we had, I think there's a ship is what we used in some of our uh, <coughs> examples here. If we have the ship moving at the velocity of the uh, control surface, and you have your squirting water out at some velocity w out of a fire hose, then we know that the velocity static that you see is just the vector sum of these two, two components. 
the velocity of the control surface plus w. I guess it's written slightly different, just backwards here. And so we looked at a couple of cases, right? So in other words, if you are moving, for instance, at uh, one meter a second, and I'm throwing something out of a hose at one meter a second from this, then this would be, it's a vector sum, this would be one meter a second plus one meter a second, which is equal to two, which makes sense, right? So you're sitting there, I'm walking in front of you one meter a second, I'm throwing something ahead of myself at one meter a second, or squirting water out of a hose. What you see of that water is it's moving past you at two meters a second to your left. If you do the opposite, and we were, for instance, to uh, move at one meter a second in this direction, but have the hose pointing backwards at one meter a second, then moving across here at one meter a second, throwing it backwards at one meter a second, to you, the ball that I drop behind me would be absolutely static to you. And so this is merely a statement that allows you to say that in these two different cases, with this uh, square bracket now, the velocity of the control surface is still plus one meter a second because it's a vector, right? has direction and magnitude, and it's minus one meter a second, and this is equal, these are equal to either two meters a second or zero meters a second, right? As the simplest manifestation of that. And so this expression here that is what we'll use. It just allows us to say, relative to you, the velocity you see something going at is equal to the velocity of the control surface that's moving, maybe a rocket, maybe a ship, plus the velocity that the stuff coming out of that thing moves at relative to the ship. Nothing more than that. And so that's an important concept for us. And so when we talk about this, uh, the balances on mass balance, then this quantity here is this velocity relative to the control surface. So it's coming out of the, uh, the, the velocity you'd see if you're sitting on the ship and it's squirting out, or if you're sitting on the rocket and the trail is coming out of the rocket, this is the velocity that comes out at. And the product of a velocity in an area is a volume rate of fluid, and multiplied by dense, uh, density is a mass rate. So this is what we'll refer to as a mass rate. The overscripted dot means a mass rate. And so this is the mass in, mass out term, which we're noting. And the other term is how much it accumulates. And so let's move down briefly to, to talk a bit about that. So just taking this expression here. So the way that we'll use this expression is if we differentiate this by parts, we have two components that can vary with time. So let's take the, the derivative with parts. So the rate of change, so let's do the density times the rate of change of volume plus the volume times the rate of change of density. All we're doing is expanding this term here, right? writing it out as you would do, plus mass flow rate <coughs> equals zero. And so what this is saying is that, and you know, the other shorthand we'll use for this, is density times rate of change of volume. We just use this superscripted dot for rate of change DDT, plus volume times rate of change of density, plus mass in minus mass out equals zero. That's all it is is a sum. And so you just need to remember some conventions on this. So physically what this would mean is if the density of water that you're flowing into a bucket is uh, the same, say, the, the, the density that you're flowing, of water you're flowing into a, uh, a balloon, you know, just a, a normal balloon that you use, a party balloon is, is constant, but it's getting larger with time, then the change in density is accommodated by the change in volume of the system. And so the control volume is just getting larger, is one example. 
This term represents if you had a tire, which is basically, or a tank, a compressed air tank, and you're putting more air into that tank, the tank can't get larger, but the density of air in that tank has to get larger. And so the, the um, sign convention is that as density goes up, or the volume goes up, so density goes up, so, so increase in volume is positive, that's plus VE, right, that's just our sign convention. Increase in density with time is also positive. And um, for the mass terms, mass <coughs> out is positive, and mass in is negative. And the reason for that is that if you look at the way that we do this accounting, the accounting is done with this normal to the boundary vector. So that's what this term is here. So you see this vector that exists in this particular term here. This length here is A, or this area here is A. And so that if you have a flow coming out of here at some velocity, which we'll call W right for the, the right-hand side, then the mass flow rate out of this thing is going to be equal to the area of this times the velocity relative to the control volume. And the velocity relative to the control volume is in the direction of the outward normal. So the dot product of these, which is kind of embodied in this, is positive. They're aligned in the same direction. The dot product, if they're aligned in the opposite direction, is minus, negative. So you, it's, you can look at the, maybe the stuff from last time just to cement that in your, your own mind. And so the mass rate to the right is equal to the area of flow, the velocity. So this, these together are a volumetric flow rate and multiplied by density. <coughs> and so together, they're a mass flow rate. If you look at the same or a velocity going into here, so we'll call this left, the outward normal to this boundary is in the opposite direction. And so from this, if you look at the left-hand component, then it's again the same cross-sectional area. Let's just be the same thing. I won't draw an arrow. It's confusing. This is also A. The velocity here is into the volume, but the outward normal vector is negative. And so when you do the dot product of these, this term here, then you end up with, instead of a positive sign here, you end up with a negative W L um, multiplied through by the density. And so the negative value is the scalar value of this velocity, whatever it is, just a number, not a direction. Uh, but because it's flowing into the volume, then we're just um, honoring this, this particular sign convention. So think about that, look at your dot products again and understand what dot products are. But the basic expression that we'll attempt to use is going to be this. And I suppose the only um, modification of that is that we need to remember that m dot, this mass flow rate, is equal to an area times a velocity times a density. So, sorry, let me write that as w since it's relative to the volume, right? So that's kind of the preamble. So that's almost the recap from, from last time. Okay? And so uh, hopefully your, heads aren't, your head isn't hurting. Um, but what we'd like to be able to do with this is we'd like to be able to solve a simple problem, and we'll try and do it, for these control volumes. So this is what we're attempting to do. We want to be able to work out how we solve a simple problem if we have a static control volume, which just is a portion of a pipe which has flow in on one side, flow out to the other side. Maybe there's some accumulation, doesn't matter. The case where we have a, a control volume that physically translates from one location to another, like a jet engine, and also the whoopee cushion balloon, which is something which changes volume uh, with time, 
but allows us to do the accounting. So what I propose to do today is to just solve a very simple example um, using these approaches where we, we draw our control volumes in an appropriate way to be able to solve exactly the same example, right? And so the example is relatively straightforward, but it all uh, revolves around this. And so if you look at the con these three ca cases that we have, these are the three cases. So this is the pipe. This is the, uh, the jet engine. If I can draw it, not a very good jet engine. And this is the, uh, the balloon flipping around in the atmosphere. The things that differ in each of these cases are that the velocity of the control surface for the static one is zero. It's not moving, right? It's fixed in space. So relative to anybody, it's, it's to, to your fra frame of reference, it's zero. If it's moving, then it has some velocity. Uh, and it's significant that we talk about the control volume versus the control surface. And the reason for that is the control volume for a, a rigid thing, if this is moving at some if this is moving at some velocity of the control volume, then the control surface here attached on the front <coughs> is also moving at the same flow rate as this control surface at the back because it's rigid, right? Tr just translating. So if the whole thing's moving at the velocity of the control volume, then the front's moving at that velocity, the back's moving that velocity, the sides are moving that velocity, and so clearly the magnitudes of the control surface are the same as the magnitudes of the control volume. If it's moving and deforming, then I suppose you could imagine the case where if this is deforming, then the control surface at the back, if this is shortening with time, I'm not sure how to draw this, you could imagine the case where this control surface at the front and at the back are not moving at the same velocity. If they're not moving at the same velocity, then you have to, how do you, how do you figure out what the, the velocity of the control volume is? You have to maybe take an average of them or choose one, but there's no diff definitive magnitude. But so, so that's kind of the idea that we maybe have to, to think about. And of course, in this, you see that these integrals here are over the control volume for the change in volume and over the control surface, if you can see, see that. Well, they, they exist here as well. So let's not get hung up on that for now. And of course, if it's not deforming, then the change in volume with time is going to be zero. But if it is deforming, then... This is just saying that v, our v dot, is not equal to zero. So, and in these cases, this is v dot. So, a bit complicated. So, what, let's, let's summarize. Summarize is that we can have moving or static control volumes. We can always figure out, relative to you as a static observer, um, what the velocity of fluids are if we know how fast the control surfaces are moving and how fast fluid is coming across that control surface just by taking the vector um, sum of those. Uh, we've written it as magnitudes, but of course these are actually vectors, right? They have x, y, and z magnitudes, but let's not worry about that. Let's only think about uh, the overall magnitudes. So we have to worry about relative magnitudes. We have to worry about whether the volume is shrinking or expanding. And we have to worry about the velocities of the control surfaces. So, so here's the example we're going to choose. So I did this a uh, little while ago. Very exciting example that we'll use. This is our, my beer-making, wine-making room in my house. And so we've sanitized it, of course, in terms of the fluids that are being used here, you'll see. And so it's a straightforward idea that we're taking a glass and we're going to fill it up. Right? The most simple example you could imagine for using, uh, for doing some calculations based on um, conservation of mass. And the mass in this particular case is, is the water that we're using. And so uh, you'll see that we have some water going into the, um, the beaker in this particular case. And, of course, it's only it's one single problem, so it should have one single solution. 
but we could treat this as a case where we have either static or moving or deforming control volume. And the idea is that we should get the same uh, answer in each of those cases. So let's attempt to, to, to solve this problem by doing, doing that. Okay? So the simple question that we might want to ask ourselves, um, if we're looking at this, what are we? We are 6.3, and it's control volumes. And it's uh, conservation of mass that we're dealing with. We can move between these, I guess. I think actually that gets lost off the top of the move. So uh, let's deal with that in some useful way. So this is our uh, so this overview. So what do you want to determine? So how long? How long to fill? Basic question. Um, and let's have a very simple geometry for this. So we have a beaker which has some area on the bottom. This isn't a length, but this is an area. And um, we have some height to it. And um, we want to be able to calculate, for instance, if we have water coming in over some area A1 of this uh, spout, and it's coming in at some velocity V1, how do we calculate that? So the simple way is to calculate the time taken to fill is equal to mass of beaker, mass of water in beaker, in full beaker, I guess. Beaker, bless you, bless you, over mass rate. So this is kilograms, yeah, kilograms, and it's kilograms per second, and so kilograms over kilograms per second is equal to, to seconds. And so what are those? Well, when this beaker's full, we know that it'll be the volume multiplied by the density. And the volume in this particular case, if I just skip here, is going to be the cross-sectional area times the height multiplied by density. Right? Nothing more than that. And the mass rate is going to be equal to the area of this jet multiplied by its velocity multiplied by its density. So this is going to be V1 times A1 times density. And so this is going to be equal to V1 A1 times density. In this case, we're not dealing with changes in density, so we can lose that. And in other words, the time taken to fill it up is just the volume divided by the volume rate, V1 A. Right. Uh, so did I lose one of those? This is A1, right? V1, A1. And so this term here is what we'll typically refer to as Q, which is a volume flow rate. And so a mass flow rate is just equal to a volume flow rate times density. Nothing more than that. So you, you know all these, these connections. So that's the easiest way to, to solve it, which we, um, which we uh, don't really need any of these concepts about control volumes to to be able to solve that, except we've kind of defined a control volume in this numerator relative to the denominator. So let's also look at that from a slightly different way. And so if you look at this um, <coughs> case here, or we're losing some of it. If uh, Can I do this? Yeah, so it's happily buzzing away here. So let's move on. So what do you see here? A couple of interesting things. So you put it under the the faucet, and see if we can get it right when I turn the faucet on, I guess. If I can step it. So we turn it on, and we look for when it first comes out. Is it going to come out? Come on. Oh, missed it. 
Oh, that's good. What? I guess that one. So here we go. I'm trying to get it. It's actually kind of cool. Look at that. So it's coming out. It's coming down to hit it. I want to catch it in mid-flight if I can. I'm not sure if I can. Right? Uh, yeah. But there's actually something interesting you can see. So when it first hits the bottom. So actually you can see this. So I, so what's happening here? You know that from a free jet, when it comes out, it has a velocity that's some magnitude. You know that it, as a free jet, as it goes down, it speeds up because of gravity. And so you could apply conservation of mass, velocity times the cross-sectional area of flow, and velocity times the cross-sectional area of flow at the bottom here. And you know it's going faster here. So you know, therefore, that to keep the same flow rate going through this, unrelated to what we're talking about now, the area here has to be less than the area here. And indeed, you see that, right? Because it's accelerating. So for continuity, for the velocity times area here to equal the velocity times area here to satisfy continuity, this area of flow has to be uh, smaller. So let's ignore that. Let's assume that we're going down to, um, when you go to get a growler full of beer, uh, which some of you may be able to do or not, at your local microbrewery, what they do is they put a tremie pipe in it, which goes down to the bottom of the uh, container, and it allows the fluid to be delivered right down to the bottom, and so you don't get expansion and you don't fill the, uh, the growler up with foam. So let's assume that we have a geometry here, and we're going to start looking at filling up a tremie pipe in the first uh, portion of this, this analysis. So let's take our, our geometry and look at it slightly differently, because our analysis for all our cases, we'll use this. So again, we have the height of the beaker as h. We have um, the overall area, which I'm drawing down here, as some amount less than that. Oh, sorry, a. And I'm filling this with a tremi pipe, which comes down, which is supplied with water at v1 and has a cross-sectional area a1. So I'm thinking of this here as a1. And the remainder of the cross-sectional area, it's not a length, it's an area of the beaker, is A2. And together, these are equal to the sum of those two, obviously. Right. And so what we could do is we could do the same calculation as before. When we turn the, the faucet on, the water starts up here, and all of a sudden it fills up this tremi pipe. And let's calculate the, the time taken to do that. So... Tremi, don't know if it's double M or single N, T-R-E-M-I-E. -E. The time taken is the mass in the pipe <coughs> divided by mass rate. And what's that going to be? The mass in the pipe is going to be the volume of the pipe, which is H times A1. That's the volume multiplied by the density of water which fills it and divided by the mass rate, which is going to be just V1, A1. Okay. If we look at the time then taken, the, su the subsequent time after that, to fill the beaker, the same is going to be true. The mass of the beaker is going to be the volume in everything but the tremie pipe, which is already filled, um, which is going to be equal to the height of the beaker times the cross-sectional area of the beaker, which is A2, and density, right? You agree with that? And the mass rate, if we write it out in longhand, is just going to be, it's no different. It's coming in at this velocity, uh, and it's flowing out at the bottom, and it's filling this up, so it's V1, A1. And so if we sum these together, then the, the time total is going to be equal to, well, you see we have the same velocity of denominator in each case, sorry, density has to be in each case. Uh, and we don't care about the densities because it's not changing, it's just water, it doesn't change very much. So if you look at the, the, the sum of these two, it's just going to be the height multiplied by A1 plus A2, divided by V1, A1. And so it's no different from before. 
obviously this term here is just equal to the sum of the two areas. And so what we've done is we've split out the portion that relates to filling up this pipe in the first place. So that's key because I want to be able to compare all of these three ways of solving the problem directly to each other, in which case they should look exactly like this. So this is going to be the solution that we'll look at. We'll look at the solution from when the water first hits the bottom of this beaker and the time taken then to fill up the rest of the beaker. So uh, I just wanted to make the point that it happens to take a certain amount of time for this thing to hit the bottom. And, uh, and we need to, to, uh, to worry about this, right? So our attempt then is to solve this in a variety of different ways. And so the first and easiest one is what? Um, static and non-deforming. Yeah, so let's, let me make sure I do this right. Yeah. Okay. We've got that. We're on course so far. And so this is the, the idea. So static and non-deforming, sorry, is that we're going to take this volume here and at some time t initial t0 when we start off, this is going to be our, our volume. We're going to make this very small, but finite. And if we look at some later time, say t1, then the control volume we have is going to be exactly the same. As suggested by the fact that it's static, it's not moving, it certainly hasn't got any bigger from time zero to time one, and so we're satisfying these, these two tenets. Okay? And so our control volume then is, is going to look something like this. So this is our beaker. It has some height, which we'll call H again. It has some, let's just divide this into two parts. This is where the velocity is coming in at some velocity V1, and it has some area A1 attached to this. We can divide it into these two parts again, which are A1 and A2. A2 on this beaker, A1 is the pipe, and the total area is equal to the sum of those two. And we have a control volume. And so the control volume is this line that I'm going to draw here. That en encompasses this. And so if we take that control volume out, if you like, just to make it a bit clearer down the bottom, and we have this velocity coming in at V1, and we know this length is A1. Um, we also have another velocity of the water coming out of here at V2, right? Because certainly the, this water surface is rising, and so clearly there's water that's coming up through this whole system uh, that's coming out of this, this component here. And so what we can do is we can write our expression. So our conservation of mass expression is change in density multiplied by the rate of change of volume plus volume times the rate of change of density plus, let's write this out in full, density times velocity times area equals zero. So our control volume, which we've drawn here, isn't getting any bigger with time, and so we lose a term. The density of fluid we're not taking to change, so we lose a term. And so we're left only with this term here. Uh, we don't actually need to deal with density because density is not changing, so we could, uh, all the terms will involve density, so we can choose whether to do that. And so let's look at the individual terms that we have that make up this. We only really have two significant faces where there's a flow across it. One is this one, and one is this one. On all the other faces we have, there's absolutely nothing flowing across this system. And so what we could do is we could, if we write this as Roman 1, 
and Roman 2, we could calculate the density times the velocity times the area on 1, add it to the density, the velocity, and the area on 2, and they should sum to 0. Okay. So what are those? Well, we don't need to deal with density, right? We can get rid of density. It just cancels out. So what is the velocity across here? The velocity across this static face is going to be velocity 1. The area is going to be equal to area 1. But what's the sense of this velocity? We said that if it's flowing in, it is negative. If it's flowing out, it's positive. It's flowing across this boundary at what velocity? V1, right? Because the, the, the boundary is uh, static. So this is flowing in, so by definition it's negative. And so this term is related to that. We're adding to this the amount which flows out of here. This is equal to the velocity 2, which is e multiplied by a2. What's this? This is outwards. This surface is static, so it's not moving at all. But this is the velocity that fluid is rising in the system, uh, and it's in the positive direction. So this is positive because it's in the same direction as the outward normal, if you think in terms of vector calculus, or if you, it's out of the system, it's positive, just by our sign convention. And this equals zero. And so what we could do is we could rearrange this equation. Actually, you've seen it before, haven't you? It's just V1A1 is equal to V2A2. If you rearrange this in terms of the velocity at point two, which we don't know, it's just going to be equal to the, the known velocity into the system divided by the ratio of these two areas. And if you want to get the time to fill, it's going to be equal to what? Uh, so velocity is equal to length over time. So time is equal to uh, length over velocity. And so if we translate this, the time to fill is going to be the length this surface has to move up to get to the top of this, and that will take the time to fill the, the beaker. So in other words, the time taken to fill is going to be the length it takes to fill the whole height of the beaker divided by the velocity of the fluid as it moves up the beaker. And if we substitute for this term here, we end up with height uh, divided, multiplied by A2 times V1, A1. And so we know the ratio of these areas because we know what they are. We know the velocity of fluid in it, and we know the height of the beaker. And hopefully this amount should be exactly the same as the amount we had right here. Yeah. Is it? H A2 over V1 A1 equals T. Okay? Identical. Right? Everyone okay? The second case was the jet engine, right? So, um, so what is that? The jet engine was non-deforming and moving. So we, we can use the same principles as before, but maybe we need a bit more uh, information first. And the extra, everyone fine with that? It's a really straightforward example. And so this is the, the idea for, for this. And so now it matters, since our control volume is moving, then relative velocities matter. I'm looking for something to throw, and this is probably good enough. So, so you can think of this in the same way that we talked about control volumes before, but now instead of talking about accelerations and using those in substantial derivatives, we can think of them in terms of velocities. So it's kind of the fire, the fire boat uh, idea. So you have a, a boat going in front of you, and it's traveling in front of you at one meter a second, if there's water squirting out of it at one meter a second as well, then relative to you, this water 
is traveling at two meters a second, right? You just add those velocities, those velocities and add them. If you have the same thing going on and the, uh, the boat is going in front of you at one meter a second and it's squirting out the back at one meter a second, then relative to you, that isn't moving at all, right? It stays static. And so we can apply the same idea to control volumes. And that idea is basically this. And that is if you think about the velocity relative to you is equal to the velocity of the boat, the control volume that's moving, plus the velocity of the hose that's squirting out of it. Right. So the boat is moving at some velocity something. If it's moving at one meter a second, then that's fine. If it's also squirting water at one meter a second, then these two things get added together, and this becomes two meters a second. So that's basically this. So the velocity of the boat, the velocity of the squirt that comes out, add them together. Relative to you, you'd see it moving at two meters a second. Boat moving at one meter a second, squirting backwards at one meter a second, then you add them together since they're a vector sum, um, then it's equal to zero. So that can, is fine for this kind of one dimensional thing, but it's also true for the vectors, right? If it happens to be moving any, in any you know, combination of directions and you're squirting out in some combination of directions, you can add the two vectors of the two systems. And the important thing here is that what we're interested in is the velocity relative to the control surface. Right? It's this one that we want. And so you can rearrange this to get W being equal to um, velocity static uh, minus the velocity of the control volume. And so that's what we'll use. So the underline in each of these just means it's a vector with x, y, and z coordinates. Uh, we won't use it in that mode, uh, but, but certainly it applies to the vectoral forms as well. Okay? So that's something that we have to deal with. And so that's exactly what this is kind of referring to here. So the velocity relative to a static observer is equal to the velocity of a, a boat plus the velocity of the, the jet of water relative squirting out of it. And so we can rearrange that. And so let's go ahead and try using that to solve this problem for this particular case of a non-deforming control volume, but that's moving. And so what, what would that mean in this particular case? Well, the control volume maybe would look like this at time t0. And then at t1, it might look like this. Ignore the fact that the glass has a slight taper on it. just makes life difficult. But in other words, the whole thing is moving up at some velocity. And we'll call this velocity v2. So that's what we're going to deal with. So if we do our little drawing of exactly what this should look like, then it will look like this. This is our beaker. It's also of height uh, h still. It's also divided into these two parts, a1 and a2. So the total is equal to a. Um, and our control volume at time zero looks like this, but at time, some other time, it looks like this. And we'll make the point that it's going up at some velocity. And it's some velocity v2, so this is t0, this is t1. And the other thing that we want to know is that this is going to be, it's going to track with the top of the, the liquid as we move up through that. And so what are the velocities that we have to, to worry about as it comes across here? This is going at v1. Uh, so, so let's write our, our uh, conservation equation again. So what is it? The product of density times the rate of change of the control volume, volume, plus the volume of that control volume multiplied by the rate of change of density. Forget that I put a dot there, it's not a dot. Plus the sum of the densities and the velocities 
and the areas of the surfaces that are moving through the system. So what do we have here? Well, we said that the, the, the volume of this thing isn't changing, and so we know that this term is going to be zero, so we can get rid of that. Um, we know that the density of the fluid isn't going to change in any significant manner, so we can get rid of that. And so now we're left with this summation of the density, the relative velocities on the surfaces, the areas of the surfaces have to equal zero. And so let's see what we do with those. What, what do we have coming into here? Maybe it's useful to, to draw this control volume out on its own. And look at the velocities. Well, we certainly have a velocity coming across here, which is v1. But we know also that this whole thing is moving up at some velocity. Yeah, stop it. V2. And so, if we, so how are we going to index these? Maybe we talk about Roman 1, Roman 2, Roman 3. Roman 4 for each of those and talk about each of those terms in point. So what's the, 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 the summation here? Well, let's not worry about the, the densities. We don't have to worry about that. So what's it going to be here? So we have an area which is um, A1. What's the velocity across here? The velocity is going to be equal to v1, but it's also moving up at v2, and so the relative velocity is going to be the, the sum of these two, I think. It's going to be net into here, and so from our sign convention it should be negative. Right? So that's the, the amount that's coming into here. Let's see if I can actually get this right. We add to this an amount which is going across this bottom boundary, and actually it's better to take both of these together, right? That's because they're not different. This bottom boundary is physically moving up at velocity v2, but it's in a stagnant fluid. So the relative velocity of water out of here, as this moves up at v2, is going to be v2. Right? So it's going to be um, v2 times the area, which is the total area of the bottom. It's just a1 plus a2, right? This whole length. And uh, the flow is net outwards, and so it's positive. Okay. And then this thing here, this is tracking, as we said, with the free surface as this kind of rises in our beaker. And so by definition, there's no net flow across here as well. So we add to that 0 times a2 <coughs> equals, bless you, 0. And so if we take these expressions, what we'd like to be able to do is to solve in terms of um, v2, because that would give us the ability, remember last time, we took the height and the velocity at which the free surface is traveling up, which is our control volume, and we can calculate how long it took to fill. So here, if we know what V2 is, we can solve our problem. So let's try and rearrange that. So what does this become? I guess it becomes V2 plus V1 multiplied by A1 is equal to uh, V2 times A. And so I guess we can rearrange that as v2, let's do it on the other side, so what's it going to be? It's going to be v2 a, and I'm going to take off minus a1, is that right? Just this term here is equal to v1 a1, and if we finally just rearrange by dividing both sides through by a minus a1 is just a2, right? Just this. This then becomes 1, and we have v2 is equal to v1 a1 over a2. And then, as we said before, the time it takes to fill is the height divided by the velocity at which this control volume is rising through the system, which is just going to be equal to h divided by v1 a1 times a2. And hopefully that should be exactly the same as this, right? Because we haven't done anything different. Is that right? A2, B1, A1. Yeah. 
that's it. So that's a, a moving control volume which isn't deforming. And so, of course, the result that we get from this should be identical to the other case as well. Okay. Everyone with us? Okay. So uh, we can also do it the final way. So these. So I guess the important thing here is right. This. This is. These are the relative velocities of flow across this boundary. You know, just by by intuition of, of what this behavior is. We could also do it by this W value, which we talked about, you know, walking across the front of the room, but it's, it's the relative uh, rate across this, this surface. Okay? So the final one. So the final one is going to be, uh, what? The, it's the, the balloon flying in the air. So it's deformable. Deforming and moving. So you could do that in a couple of different ways, and I think in the in the notes you can see it done in two different ways. And so the easiest way to do deforming and moving would be to take a control surface that looks like this. At time t0. And that looks like this. At time t1. You could argue whether it's moving. It's certainly deforming because it's getting bigger. Right, but it's uh, it's moving up through the system. So you could do it that way. It turns out that that's not quite as easy a way to do it as we might choose. Um, I guess I can can I raise this? Can I actually can I? Control Z will take me back. Yeah, okay. So don't worry about those control volumes. So the other way we could do it would be to take a control volume that looks like this at time. Zero, and then looks like this at time t1, right? Looks very complicated, but it's much easier to do that. So let's kind of draw that out the way we that we have done in the past. So we have this beaker; it's of some height. Um, it's filling up down this tremi pipe on one side. This tremi pipe is of diameter uh, area A1 and A2. Are these just two different sides? Together they come, they equal the, the magnitude of A, the areas, not lengths. And the control volume we're going to take is this. So it's going to look like across here, across here, across here, so it's this backwards L shape. And so it's just because it's easier. You could do it the way we did it before. And I think there's an example of uh, both, doing it both ways. Of course, you should get the same result. And so we still have the same velocity coming in. The top of this is going to move up at some velocity, which we're going to call V2, which we don't know yet. And we can write some kind of balance equation for this just to conserve. We're just conserving mass. So remember, our balance equation is the control volume multiplied by the rate of change of density in that control volume, plus the density of the fluid multiplied by the rate of change of volume of the control volume, plus um, the mass rate of flux is in, so this is W A equals zero. So what do we have now? Well, still it's water. We're not changing the density, so this term is equal to zero. But what's different now is that the volume of our control volume is changing with time. And so we need to be able to account for that. And we also need to be able to account for these. So we're going to be, able to, we're going to be working with, I guess, these two parts. So let's deal with the volume change first. What is the rate of change of volume? Well, the only thing that's changing is that this boundary here is moving up at some velocity and it covers some area which is A2. So the rate of change of volume is what? It's just the velocity V2 multiplied by the area. Right? Top's going up uh, this velocity. It has cross-sectional area. So velocity times an area is length cubed over time which is a, a rate of change of volume. So that's not velocity, it's volume, sorry. Okay, 
So we have this. And we also need to look at uh, accounting for these. Let's put them down together. So we have density times velocity of the surface, top surface times its area. So that's this term here. And so what about the other components that we would have? Uh, what, what? This is static, but we have water going across this. This is static. It's, it's the side of the tumbler, so there's nothing there, nothing there either. And of course, this is attached to the top surface, and so there's no water going across there either. And so what we have is the, the only flux into it is going to be this one, which is going to be um, the density of the fluid times its relative velocity relative to this static surface, which is going to be V1 and multiplied by A1. The flow across this surface is into the system, and so by our sign convention, this is negative. If we did the dot product, it would give that automatically, but we're not going to worry about that. And this is equal to zero. And so from this, uh, we have this, we have this, we have, um, well, actually V2, A2, this looked very familiar to you, is equal to V1, A1, uh, which comes out of this naturally. And so this also says that the velocity 2 is going to be equal to the input velocity divided by the ratio of these two areas. And if we take the time it takes to fill, it's going to be equal to the height of the beaker divided by the velocity at which it rises. Then we just have h divided by v1, a1, a2. That's it. And so this is exactly the expression that we've had for all of these things as well. Right? If you go back, it's the product of the flow rate in. So this term on the bottom is just Q1, if you like. Just the volumetric flow rate in. And this is the volume that it has to fill. And um, you could, we've done it by a variety of different ways. But in every case, we've ended up with the same result, which of course we should, right? Because it's the same physical problem. And so that's basically uh, control volumes and figuring out exactly how you, you work out the amounts going across boundaries. Um, we haven't kind of trumped through the notes, but you've seen from this, I think, that as you go through this, if we just look at this, these different cases, um, these are uh, non-deforming and non-stationary, just done in different ways. Actually, this is this, exactly the same one that we did. So this one we did, this is our... Uh, jet engine, if you like. This is the one where the control volume is changing, where we have to account for this in our dot product. And if you do it either the way we did it, with this part here static, and this thing moving up at some velocity v2, or if you do it where the whole control volume, instead of being this size at time t0, uh, migrates to being this size at some later time, you just have to take off an extra term here to account for that. It works out to be exactly the same um, expression. And so that's it. That's, that's what we're doing. It's important to understand this because ultimately we'll apply this not only to just masses or volumes, conserving masses, which is, of course, just a, a scalar quantity. It has, has, has magnitude but not direction. But we'll use it to conserve uh, momentum and also energy, kinetic energy as well and different kinds of energy. But you can look through the, the results that we've gone through to be able to figure out exactly what, what we've attempted to do. So the tenets of this are pretty straightforward. And they're, they're kind of highlighted on this first summary slide. And it is that we can use this expression. We will never have to use it any different from this. But we can always use this expression to represent the product of density and the rate of change of the volume of the control volume. Uh, we can look at the control volume multiplied by the rate of change of density, which is just by taking this expression here and expanding it out. And we just have to make sure that when we sum up the components that we're dealing with here for the product of density, um, the velocity across the boundary, and the area, the things to remember are that this has to be the relative velocity across <coughs> that boundary. Uh, you can think of it, if you like, if you prefer to think of it, this is really a mass rate of flow, right? This is really just m dot. And these parts 
are used depending on what exactly we're doing. But this is just a mass rate of flow. And so long as you know what the mass rate of flows, you just have to remember the sign convention. And that is if it's net in, it's negative. And if it's net, or it's, I don't know whether it should be net in or net out, but if it's flowing into the control volume, it's negative. And if it's control, flowing out of the control volume, it's positive. And the reasons for that, you can always remember, are that this is just a dot product. Right? This, this dot product basically says that if you're flowing into something and the outward normal of that boundary is like this, and the flow velocity across this boundary is this direction, then the dot product v dot n is negative. Right? Because they're going in opposite directions. If you're flowing across this boundary, and the flow in this direction is this vector, it's aligned exactly with the, the normal to the boundary, the outward normal to the boundary, then v dot n is positive. Positive. Right? That, that's the reason for this. You don't have to know that, uh, but you have to, to rationalize why that is. You have to use the appropriate sign convention. And um, so these other ones, the sign convention for this is that the volume gets bigger, that's positive. And as the density gets higher, that's positive as well. So those are just the sign conventions uh, you can use. All the examples we've done have been for changing volumes, but for liquids, and therefore this hasn't changed. If you're filling a tire up, of course, in a constant volume, then this term becomes finite and you have to deal with it. But that's basically control volumes. So I think that's really exciting stuff. Right? I think it's a nice way to, to show it. The bottom line is that all of these examples, because they're the same physical example, because it's the same physical example of us filling a beaker, they should all be give the same results. And so irrespective of the reference frame that you choose, uh, they should all give the final results of how long it takes to, to fill this beaker. And the magnitude that we got, of course, is, if, I, if you remember, is the values we're talking about are once you, so once you get that bead of water all the way down to the bottom, that's our time zero when we start in this particular case. In other words, you have a tremie pipe, you have your Otto's double D always at the bottom of this tremie pipe, and it's ready to f f upwell into the rest of the growler, and that's when we're starting our, our time as time zero. And if we do that, then the magnitude that we get out of this is going to be the same in each of these cases, but it's not, it, it's without this part when we first fill up this, this beaker.